Hi there everyone, it is time to see NB once again here on the NDTV network. I'm Siddharth and Ike Patankar and you've had a glimpse of what's coming up. So let's get straight to those two new bikes. Now these are important for each of their brands in very different ways. For Suzuki, the GSX S750 becomes a very significant model that might help shape the brand. While for Honda, it is about trying to finally get some decent volumes in that 160cc space with the new X-Blade. After launching the Unicorn and the CB Hornet, Honda is trying hard to get a good chunk of the 1cc segment in India. To bridge the tiny gap between those two comes the new X-Blade 160. With the exception of the cycle parts, the X-Blade gets brand new body parts when compared to the Hornet. New side panels, new fuel tank, the headlamp unit and the instrument cluster are all new. And that is a good thing. Chisel fuel tank with a 4 carbon finish on the top adds to the sporty feel. The bike's fit and finish and the material used are better than the current crop of Hondas. The X-Blade gets a full LED headlamp that provides better illumination. The headlamp styling also lends it a robot-like face. There's a fully digital instrument console which houses the speedometer, odometer, the rev counter along with the fuel gauge and the gear position indicator. The T-shaped LED tail lamp also looks quite cool. The X-Blade uses the same engine as the CB Hornet 160R. It makes just under 14 bhp with peak torque rated at 13.9 Nm. Incidentally, the CB Hornet 160R makes 14.9 bhp and 14.5 Nm of torque. The torque on the X-Blade though comes in at lower RPMs. Coming to the performance of the bike, we really like the grunt, the torque that the engine generates in the mid-range. It is very helpful in the city riding. Also, the bike is very flickable, which makes filtering through traffic very easy. But as the rev counter goes beyond 6500 RPM, the vibrations begin to creep in from the foot pegs and the handlebars. It is not jarring, but we do miss the familiar smoothness one expects from a Honda engine. The 5-speed gearbox though is smooth. Getting through traffic is easy enough and while the bike is not tight through corners, it gets the job done without a fuss. Its compact dimensions means the X-Blade can be muscled to the narrowest of gaps and so it really shines in urban chaos. The suspension on the bike is not exactly pliant but not back-breaking either, though we wish Honda would have fitted a slightly softer seat on the X-Blade. The X-Blade is priced at 79,000 rupees and it is for those who want a little more than the Unicorn and are happy with a little less than the Hornet. Now we head to the track for yet another bike. It's muscular with aggressive looks and tremendous road presence. It is the latest middleweight performance naked, the Suzuki GSX S750. Another day, another racetrack, another brand new motorcycle. We are at the Bud International Circuit to ride the brand new Suzuki GSX S750. Well, it's a naked bike. Uh, Suzuki says it's built for riders who want to graduate to their first big bike. Uh, makes about 100 odd bhp, more than 100 bhp actually. And so it's got, uh, according to Suzuki, very good road manners. You can do occasional track riding and you can even go touring on it and use it on a daily commute as well. Out on the track, the Suzuki GSX S750's performance is immediately likable. The engine has been derived from the K5 GSX R750, but the engine has been tuned for better mid range yet retains that same maniac personality of the famous super spot it is based on. Across the first few corners and into the long back straight of the track, the GSX S750S's performance is impressive.
We touched about 213 on the back straight here, 214. That's more than the four points you need really. And the engine is super smooth. Great engine, impeccable handling. It goes, dips into corners like nobody's business. You feel super confident on this bike. What I want right now is to find out how this baby behaves on the street. For now, I really like the Suzuki GSX SN50. It may not be a little class bike, but if you're upgrading from a 45, 50, 60 bhp bike to this one, it will not disappoint you. I really like it. The free revving engine begs to be pushed hard and there is no hint of any roughness or vibrations with a strong mid-range. The bike doesn't require frequent gear changes and that would make it easy to live with out on the streets and in traffic. The GSX S750 looks near identical to the Liter class GSX S1000. It has the same chisel fuel tank, an aggressive face with a fat upside down fork and sleek rear end. The LCD instrument panel is also shared with the GSX S1000. It has good visibility and is packed with information. If you're the kind of rider who's been riding a 300, 400cc performance, entry-level performance bike and you want to upgrade to your first middleweight performance bike, this one packs enough four points to keep you entertained every single day. 113 bhp, more than enough performance. And if you're the kind of guy who's been riding in your college days, haven't ridden for the last 10-15 years, want to get back into riding, you don't want a cruiser kind of a bike, you want a slightly performance-oriented motorcycle but not something which is over the top, overwhelming, intimidating. This one is the right bike to get back into motorcycling. The Suki GSX S750 is certainly an impressive machine. It's got brilliant performance, impressive handling, superb brakes and an intake and exhaust row which is immediately likeable. With a curb weight of 215 kilograms, it is no lightweight machine and you do feel the weight especially at low speeds. But on the move, the GSX S750 feels nimble, well planted and gets a decent safety net with the standard ABS and traction control. Priced at 7,45,000 rupees, what's left is to see how it performs in the real world and if it has the goods to make it a great all-rounder on the racetrack, on the highway and even in the city. Now an introduction to the Kia Rio. Is it coming to India? No, no such confirmation from Kia. But it's a car I certainly hope Kia brings to India because it's ideal for our market. Why? Well, it's the segment, it's the design, and it's also the attribute and driving performance of that car that makes me believe that it's the right fit for our market. Take a look, see where it fits in and what it compares to, and then you be the judge of that. The Kia Rio is a premium hatchback that is now in its fourth generation. A popular model for Kia in Europe, it is also sold in a sedan body style alongside the hatch in the US. And the car you see is indeed brand new, having just made its global debut earlier this year. All right, let me set the context of this for you. Now, the Kia Rio is in its new generation that arrived just late last year. So it's brand new on the global stage and uh, it's a car that's been really popular for Kia in many markets. And that is what it shares its platform with. Yes, the i20 and the uh, Rio are similar cars in terms of platform and powertrain. But in terms of styling, you can see it. I mean, of course, this is the new facelifted i20 and this is the uh, all new generation of the Kia. Like I said, they couldn't be more different. This is not an India spec, that is, and so of course this car sits a little bit lower to the ground. Ignore that aspect, but take a look at them in terms of attribute. You start to understand what the Rio is then all about. Like the Rio, the Hyundai i22 is very European and offers great looks, space, good ride and overall drivability and decent value. It also just received its mid-cycle facelift, 
which India got first at the Auto Expo in February. And yes, I know the Baleno outsells the i20, but it's the i20 that I still think is the segment benchmark car for us in India. The Rio can also be all of that. And if positioned right, has the goods to threaten the i20's status. And it's not just because of its sexy looking face and overall stance. Now, the primary reason why Kia has seen just so much strength over the last few years globally is on the back of really sexy design. Its cars have gotten so much more attractive and you have Peter Schreier to thank for that. This car also designed by Peter Schreier and uh, the signature is in that front grille. Now, this part has become the family look of all Kias. We showed it to you before, even at the Auto Expo, all the cars had it. And uh, it makes the car look just a little more ready for action. Of course, remember, I've been saying this throughout, this is not an India spec car. It is the global spec, which is why it sits a lot lower. Nice big wheels as well. And uh, if this was to be launched in India, well, you better believe it. That part of the story will certainly change because the suspension will be tuned differently for India. It will probably be raised, which is a pity, really, because the car looks really sexy hunkered down like that. Uh, in terms of proportion and size, uh, nothing special because, of course, it's what you need to do in the hatchback space. But again, come around to the back and you start to get a little sense of that flamboyance uh, in the tail light where the LED treatment, it's simplistic and yet very sharp, very modern indeed. And can't go wrong with this wonderful red color, can you? So the Rio is a looker, but its overall proportions and profile are a bit predictable. It also does not have the muscle of the i20. Having said that, we are not doing a comparison review here. Where the Kia could score were it to come to India is on the interior, which is certainly fresh for the segment. Now remember today, this is not a review because I can't talk about this in the context of something coming to the market. But having said that, I think what uh, I can talk about is just the overall change that might come in if something like this was to arrive in our market. Now by this, what I mean is that in that mass car space, you get a little lift up in terms of quality of plastics and also the molding around them. It's a really smartly done dash. I remember the first time I saw this car at uh, one of the motor shows last late last year when it made its global debut. Uh, the new generation, I think, just brings this sense of quality with it. So the interior design, just as attractive as the exterior. Of course, the four leather seats, uh, the nice all black sporty treatment does tend to look pretty cool. It has a sunroof as well for what it's worth. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm telling you that if a car like this was to come to us, of course, make no mistake, the small touch screen would be replaced by a big one and you'd get Apple CarPlay and you'd get Android Auto and possibly navigation. This car right now doesn't have all that. But again, this is not about market spec right now. It's just about showing you what's possible. And uh, with the Rio, I think a fair amount is. So the cabin is sexy and young and very different indeed. Nice. And that's where the i20's cabin that's been recently refreshed and I have to say much better loaded in this top spec that I have today would still seem a little predictable. But the i20's cabin does come across as roomier which could be a slight weakness for any proposed entry to this segment by the Rio. All right, all of this is fine, but I know what you're asking. How does it drive? After all, sharing a platform for the i20 would mean that performance would be familiar, right? Now, globally, the Rio comes in several engines. There's the 1.2, 1.4 and 1.6 petrol. You've also got the diesel, of course, but that 1.2, the Kappa, that's the familiar engine for us because we know it from several Hyundai models. I mean, the Grand i10, the, the i20 as well. And uh, interestingly, that is the engine on the car I'm driving right now too. So it brings the familiarity home really in many, many manners of speaking. But I'm not going to get into performance per se simply because it's not as if this car is launching in this spec in India. But I will tell you this, that uh, it's the ride and handling, especially the ride quality, that really has me very impressed and would really work well as a key differentiator in the Indian context too, I think. Now, the other quick point to mention, the Rio in the fourth generation was never launched in Korea, its home market. Instead, 
you have the Rio based Stonic, the cross hatch that uh, Korea got as the sole offering. But you know what? Both of them selling side by side could be a great business case for India. The i20 also has a very European character on the road, a bit of a USP on this second generation car. The facelift retains that character and only claims to offer more by way of acceleration and efficiency. The Rio, with a similar power plant, should be able to match that offering almost to the T. Hmm, so sportier ride and handling may have me impressed, but that's because this car is European spec. But like I said, that kind of spec could do wonders for creating a new paradigm in this market too. And that is why it is my belief that even though Kia plans to begin its India innings with a compact SUV, planning to quickly also enter the premium hatch space would also be very logical. The Rio has the goods to make that pitch, in my opinion. Now the question is, do you agree? And does Kia? Now in case you haven't recognized it, the car with me on the show today is the Ford Freestyle. This is the brand new model from Ford and uh, is offered in petrol and diesel and takes on that whole cross hatch semi SUV segment. So I'd like to know what you think about this car, but uh, that's not why I'm driving it. We have an interesting comparison on it coming up. Not today. You'll have to wait for that and be a little patient. Today, we are going to, like I said, crank it up a notch. In fact, several notches with the new E63 from Mercedes AMG. And uh, you know what? I really wanted to drive that car, but things didn't go to plan. Take a look. So we finally have the regular wheelbase E-Class, but in a very potent Avatar. So we finally have the regular wheelbase E-Class in a more potent AMG Yeah, seriously? Really sorry, I just can't resist the car. And come on. I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Okay, last take. We finally have the regular wheelbase E-Class, but in a very, very potent sort of an up. You know what? You're so excited by the car. Let him drive it. AMG sold more than 1.3 lakh cars around the world last year. And although the likes of the mean green AMG GTR or the sexy GTC Roadster gets all the eyeballs, it is stuff like this that make AMG so desirable. This might look like a spruced up E-Class, but it is more than that. So, so much more. Presenting the thinking man's muscle car in its newest avatar, the Mercedes AMG E63S 4MATIC Plus. And yes, that name is quite the mouthful. Being an AMG, the car has to look the part. The front end in particular oozes sheer muscle thanks to the creases on the bonnet and a more muscular bumper. The grille gets two chrome slats joining on the star symbol, keeping the whole affair classy and elegant. And unlike the standard car that comes in India with the long wheelbase, the AMG only gets the standard wheelbase that's shorter by 140mm. The shorter wheelbase of course adds to that sportier stance of the car, especially when viewed in profile since the AMG is not just shorter but also a lot lower than the standard car. Around the back you get the telltale quad pipe setup and of course those tasty chrome finished AMG and E63S badges. So let's discuss numbers. The E63S gets a 4 litre V8 turbocharged engine that makes 603 horsepower and a massive 850 newton meters of torque. The engine is paired to a very slick AMG Speed Shift 9 speed sport transmission. The performance of the car is mental, absolutely mental. Although we got a very brief opportunity to drive the Mercedes AMG E63 S4 Matic Plus sedan, one can never get enough of any car which has AMG written on it. Yes, this is the car we are talking about. We are happy to report that. This sedan is a proper hooligan. This is the perfect car for parents who like to drop their kids to school and then after that head to the nearest racetrack like we are at BIC for some weekend shenanigans. Hmm. 
close to the red line, the E63 makes the kind of noises that Thor would make when angry at the man who killed Loki. Break and shift down and the overrun will make you gleam with joy and put a giant smile on your face. For a full-blown 4-door sedan, the E63S does a damn good job of sticking to the line and handles really well. Sure, it is an AMG with a V8, but that does not mean it cannot transport 4-5 to five people in great comfort. We did get a limited amount of time with the car, but a few things that caught our eye were the Bamesta audio sound system, Napa leather upholstery, climatized front seats and the regular Mercedes command infotainment system. We drove the car very briefly on track and the perfect way to describe it will be Dr. Bruce Hanna and the Hulk. The car could work very well as a daily driver and can turn into a track fiend in the blink of an eye. Now we look forward to testing in on regular city streets and get you a thorough road test. Of course, that will happen very soon. So King Shook getting lucky there with the latest AMG model and I think he had quite a blast, I'm sure you'll agree. It's nice also to have the regular wheelbase, like I was trying to say at the start of the E-Class finally here in India because of course it's daughter to drive and the AMG engine just makes it even more fun. Please react to what you've seen on today's program. You've got to tell me what you'd like to see as well and promise me you'll wear your seatbelts front or back and helmets front or back. Bye-bye.